We saw earlier how male elephant seals attempt to mate with as many of the females that come ashore into their territories as they can. Some males are far more successful than others in this activity. In fact, one study showed that as few as 4% of males are responsible for 85% of the matings in a breeding season. Since males compete with each other for access to females, being bigger and more aggressive is clearly a successful adaptive strategy for male elephant seals. Smaller and less aggressive males of previous generations were simply less successful. In this case, it was the big bullies that left descendants. But what about the much smaller and less aggressive females? Is this one example where being much smaller than the males means that they really have no choice in the matter of reproduction? It turns out that even in elephant seals, females are able to influence which male mates with them. When a bull mounts a cow seal, she gives out a loud call that can be heard by nearby males. Have a listen to this elephant seal mating with a female making such conspicuous noises. If the suitor is a subordinate male, then he will invariably be chased off by the larger one who then takes his place. In this way, females are able to ensure that the largest, most dominant males inseminate them. It might be argued that females in the past, which did not give out such calls, left fewer aggressive male descendants than those that did so. In this way, we can see how female behavior can have an effect on both the male and female offspring that are produced. Even in cases where males are much larger than females, female choice plays a role in reproduction. Since the 1980s, evidence has accumulated for the direct influence of female choice, both on male physical features and on their reproductive success. The first clear-cut evidence of the importance of female choice involved precisely the feature that Fisher had suggested, elaboration of tail feathers, not in peacocks, but in the African widowbird. Found in the grassy plains of Kenya, this species is polygynous, such that one male mates with several females. In contrast to the mottled brown, short-tailed females, the jet black male widowbirds have red epaulets and, importantly, a very lengthy tail, averaging 50 centimeters compared to the 7 centimeter average for females. Males maintain territories into which they attempt to attract females. By sporadically leaping up above the long grass and showing off their magnificence of their fanned out tail feathers. Females that land in a territory frequently mate with a resident male and afterwards build nests there into which they lay their eggs. It had long been suspected that females decide which territory to land in based on the tail length of territory holders. Scandinavian ethologist Malty Anderson decided to check this with an elegant field manipulation. It involved the use of scissors and superglue. If you were using scissors and superglue yourself, generating procedural setups for uh, testing Anderson's hypothesis, what would be the independent variable? That's the variable that you intentionally manipulate. The setup must at least involve scissors, superglue, and feathers, but you could add more if you like. What would you expect to change in response? That would be the dependent variable. Formulate your prediction for how the independent variable affects the dependent variable, which is roughly a statement of your hypothesis. Think through the logistical methods you would use to actually carry out such an experiment, although this is just a thought experiment. In Anderson's experiment, he determined the number of nests in a range of territories. And then, by cutting and gluing their tail feathers, Anderson created four different groups of males. One group had their tails extended to 75 centimeters. Another had their tails reduced to 14 centimeters, and two control groups were allowed to retain their original tail length. Following these manipulations, Anderson observed no change in the size of male territories. But in contrast, 
found that females now preferred to nest in the territories of the long-tailed more than with the short-tailed males by a ratio of four to one. Anderson's field experiment has frequently been cited as the first real demonstration of the power of female choice. As a driving force for male adornment and reproductive success, but it has not been without its critics. For one thing, female choice was inferred from the number of nests produced in a male's territory, rather than via the number of young fledged or from the number of matings observed. If Anderson's study is open to interpretation, then a series of follow-up lab-based studies appear to demonstrate the effects of female choice unequivocally. Haynes and Gould, for example, demonstrated that female guppies preferred males with longer tails, even though a longer tail slows them down. When offered a choice between males of various sized tails, females chose both to spend more time with long-tailed males and to mate with them. Furthermore, the offspring produced also had longer tails just like their fathers. This finding is important because, as is the case for natural selection, for sexual selection to be accepted, it is necessary that the features chosen are heritable. Incidentally, in what may be thought of as the icing on the cake for supporters of female choice, just as Fisher originally suggested, one study has now demonstrated that peahens really do prefer to mate with peacocks with the most elaborate tail feathers. Whether they do so because it demonstrates good genes or simply because it is sexy is still open to debate, however. A common put down to someone we want to imply as both brutish and unattractive is to refer to them as a Neanderthal. Interestingly, despite this commonly held view of how primitive and unappealing the Neanderthals were, it now appears that there might be some science behind such a remark. The Neanderthals were a subspecies of early Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. Although some experts consider them to constitute a separate species, Homo neanderthalensis. In addition to a heavy, compact body, they also had robust faces with large, wide noses and prominent brow ridges. Neanderthals are named after the Neander Valley in Germany, where the first specimen was found. They evolved from a different branch of Homo erectus, appeared around 130,000 years before present in various parts of Europe and Central Asia. They disappeared from the fossil record around 25,000 years ago. Perhaps modern Homo sapiens drove them to extinction. Some of their genes, however, appear to have lived on and are with us today. In 2010, the Neanderthal Genome Project reported that modern humans living outside of the sub-Saharan Africa typically have between 1 and 4% of Neanderthal genes. Here's some more in-depth information about the Neanderthal genome and their similarities to us with genes for speech. Neanderthals were a group of humans that existed in Western Asia and Europe until they became extinct around 30,000 years ago. And they are fascinating, I think, because they are truly our closest evolutionary relatives. No other organism is as closely related to humans today as they were. So it's very fascinating to compare us to them because we can then really look at what is it that makes us unique compared to everyone else on this planet. And you're now involved in sequencing the entire set of genetic instructions mm. of Neanderthal. And what will those exact instructions, mm. its genome, mm. tell us about us? So, well, so far we have the human genome, our own genome, and we have the genome of the chimpanzee, our closest living relative. So we could then find all the changes, all the features in our genome that have changed on the evolutionary lineage us since we shared a common ancestor with the chimps. But that's quite a long time ago, say five to seven million years ago. When we will now have the genome of our closest relative, the Neanderthal, we will be able to say what changed in our genome in the last little bit of human evolution, the last 300, 400,000 years when fully modern humans appear for the first time. So these are then guys with a skeleton that's indistinguishable from ours. And among those genetic changes, we then hope that there will lie hints about what sets us apart, such things that made human technology possible, that made art possible, that made it possible for us to colonize the entire planet. Now you mentioned that 
you'd like to see how we're similar or different to Neanderthal and similar or different to chimps. Could you give us an example of a gene that we share with Neanderthal, but that we do not share the same variation with chimps? So one gene that we've been particularly interested in since a long time actually is a gene called FOXP2. And that's the only individual gene we know of today that has to do with language and speech ability in humans. And we know that because if we have a mutation in human that knocks out one copy of this gene that we got from our mom or our dad, then we have a severe language problem and a speech problem, primarily about articulation, actually muscle control in the mouth and in the throat when we speak. And this gene is interesting because it has two changes in the protein it encodes that's specific to humans that you see in no other apes or monkeys. So we were very interested in looking in Neanderthals and see if this was something unique to modern humans or not. And somewhat to our surprise actually, it turned out that we share this with Neanderthals. Neanderthals look like, just like us with respect to this genetic change. So that then suggests that at least from the very little that we know about speech, there's no reason to assume that they couldn't articulate in speech as we do. That said, of course, we have to say there are lots of genes there that has to do with speech that we don't know yet where they could have differed. But from the very tiny little thing we know today, there's no reason to assume they weren't like us. Why would humans have Neanderthal DNA? Clearly ancient humans made it with Neanderthals, but why? This begs the question, what role did sexual selection play here? Is it conceivable for early anatomically modern humans to have found some features of Neanderthals attractive? We can only speculate that at least some of our ancestors found at least some of them attractive enough to form a romantic attachment. Throughout the animal kingdom, it appears to be males that bluff and duel with each other over resources such as territories or food, but ultimately all of the power struggles will be pointless without the presence of females. In the long run, males compete for fertile females, and they do so in many different ways. Lions, baboons, and chimpanzees all form alliances in order to physically usurp other males and steal their mates. American red-winged blackbirds and European robins defend territories and sing to lure females into them. Many species of frogs and toads wrestle with each other for the opportunity to fertilize a female's eggs even as she lays them. One species, which has been studied over many years in relation to male-male competition, is a Scottish red deer. By making field observations over a number of years, field ethologist Tim Clutton Brock and his co-workers have demonstrated that the relationship between sexual selection and reproductive behavior is more complex than had previously been thought. As is frequently the case for members of the deer family, stags live in all-male herds outside the breeding season. At the beginning of the breeding season, they begin to threaten each other and engage in physical combat to compete for harem territories. Harem territories are similar to resource defense harems, except that the territory is the stable home of a core group of females, while a series of males are displaced over the breeding season. Also, males frequently attempt to round up and steal females from nearby territories. Stags that are successful in defending a harem must constantly be vigilant since threats to their supremacy are common. Typically, a stag will warn off challengers by producing some 3,000 loud roars each day. When an intruding stag makes a challenge, the two males undergo a highly ritualized sequence of responses. This begins with a long series of roars. If the intruder cannot keep up, he will normally withdraw at this point. If he does not back down, then the next stage is parallel walking during which each stag appears to eye up the size and strength of his competitor. If at this point neither backs down, then the competitors lock their antlers. And a vigorous wrestling match ensues until one of the combatants is exhausted and retreats. Due to their variability in size in comparison to the does, red deer stags vary greatly in their reproductive success. Extensive field studies, however, have revealed that size can also pay dividends for females in the game of reproduction. Larger does are able to exclude smaller ones from the luscious parts of the territory, and by improving their own grazing opportunities are able to increase the quantity of milk they provide 
for their suckling calves. This means that the calves of a dominant doe are most likely to build up their fat reserves necessary to survive the first winter. Furthermore, the most important predictor of an adult stag's reproductive success is his weight at the time of weaning. This means that the size and competitive behavior of a doe plays a very important role in determining the success for male offspring. This demonstrates how intrasexual selection can also be important to both sexes, and that the female-female competition of one generation can have a knock-on effect on male-male competition in the next. It may be too simplistic to consider each sex in isolation when assessing the effects of sexual selection on a species. Perhaps in order to understand the strategy of one sex, we must always consider the strategies of the other and the ecological pressures that exist. Field studies that have considered sexual selection demonstrate how it not only affects body size and weaponry, but also levels of aggression and the social structure of a group of animals. The more we look at sexual selection, the more intertwined and all-pervading we realize it is. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.